This is WCN. The Whole Care Network. You talk. We listen. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Caring for aging parents or other loved ones while working, raising children, and trying to live your own life? Wondering how to find the time for your personal health and happiness? Well, you're in the right place. Welcome to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast, the show where real family caregivers share how to be happy and healthy while caring for others. Now, here's your host, family caregiver and certified caregiving consultant, Elizabeth Miller. Hello, everyone. Thanks for listening and tuning in to the Happy Healthy Caregiver Podcast on the Whole Care Network. If this is your first time checking out our show, welcome. We are a podcast produced bi-weekly to help family caregivers integrate self-care and caregiving into their lives. As always, all of our episodes have an accompanying show notes page, so if you're listening while you are running errands and out and about, no worries. You'll find the show notes by going to happyhealthycaregiver.com, and underneath the podcast menu, just click the image for today's show. Today's show is sponsored by the Just For You Daily Self-Care Journal. How's your self-care these days? Life can get busy and overwhelming, and it feels like a struggle to prioritize our own health and happiness. This is Elizabeth from HappyHealthyCaregiver.com. My passion is helping people integrate self-care into their lives. One of the resources I created to help is called Just For You, a daily self-care journal. This journal is a fun and easy way to become more intentional about your own well-being. The book includes 365 writing prompts and monthly activity pages. Personalize each page with splashes of color and your own creativity. Visit happyhealthycaregiver.com to purchase the journal as a gift to yourself or someone you care about. Welcome back. Just a note that our show does have some explicit language in the episode today, so be mindful of who you're listening to the show around. In today's show, we are shining the caregiver spotlight on Erin Gallion. Erin is a pharmaceutical sales trainer, speaker, and published author. In 1997, Erin lost her dad, Mike, to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and in 2018, she lost her sister, Megan, to a rare lung disease. Both of these heartbreaking life events, combined with her professional experience, have taught Erin how to effectively advocate for a patient. Very important for all of us family caregivers. As a result, Erin's vision in life is to share this knowledge of advocacy with others so that they can do the same. In 2020, she published her first book, Badass Advocate, Becoming the Champion Your Loved One Deserves. In Badass Advocate, she talks us through the eight badass strategies for advocating for a patient who is either homebound or hospitalized. And she shares those eight strategies in today's show, plus a whole lot more. So, welcome Erin Gallion to the show, and we hope that you enjoy listening. Hello, Erin. Welcome to the show. Good morning. How are you? Good. Um, and I love that you you told me beforehand, Gallion rhymes with scallion. So, Erin yes. Gallion, welcome to the show. We are excited <laughs> that we are connecting today. Um, I have a funny story for you before we get going, is I had originally had this, like, school marm teacher cardigan on this morning because I work my day job and I thought I can't talk to the badass um, (laughs) advocate and not have and have this this cardigan on so I went and put my leather jacket on for you well your leather jacket is pretty badass I have to say I did pick up on that right away (laughs) thank you so I'm going for the badass vibe for those of you that are watching the podcast versus listening to it which is always an option on YouTube. Um, I love to give caregivers flexibility. We need all the flexibility and the options we can, we can, we can have. So, uh, I'm looking forward to getting to know you, but we always kick off the show with, uh, words of inspiration and encouragement from the happy, healthy caregiver jar. This is just a jar that I, um, put together for my sister. 
And she, we were transitioning care for my mom, um, primary care from me to her. And I just felt like I was giving her this mammoth stuff and there was like nothing that could really. And so I felt like, well, this will give me a little bit of a self-care bully in her ear. She could pull every day and just, um, get affirmed about what she was doing and, and have some encouragement. So Let's see I what we get. That. Thank you. Sisters are the best. Look at you. I love sister it. Sister power. That's, I know we're going right. to talk about your sister and I have two sisters and they are, um, yeah, they are the shit we've already, we already know we're going to have explicit content in this episode. That was the other thing. I think you're <laughs> going to be my first explicit, um, <laughs> episode. So I will put a warning in the, in the intro, but um, so, so yeah, sisters of the ship, we can say that. Yeah, so they are, they are. today's inspiration says you have to stick up for yourself, decide that you're going to take care of yourself, decide again and again until it becomes a new habit. This is so true. And this is so fitting for my book and this conversation, because the first line about sticking up for yourself being a badass advocate is about sticking up for yourself and for your loved one. It's about having that voice that sometimes we're really afraid to have. And as we go through my story and I'll, and I'll share some details and things that I've learned along the way. The one thing that I learned was I may not feel comfortable speaking up all the time, but I'm going to force myself because I want to do it for my sister. So I'm the person that I love so much. And I know we all want to do that, but sometimes it's so scary, especially when it comes to, healthcare providers. And we think they're so smart and they are, but yes. we're smart too. And we have something to offer as well. We are smart and we are the experts in ourselves and in our family members. So yes, yes. definitely. We, um, we, we need to speak, speak up. I think even in this role, right? Like in starting a business and you've got with your blog and your book, it's like, you also kind of question yourself, like, who am I to have a podcast, write a book, you know, speak in front of right. people. But the way that someone described it to me at some point is it's like, it's a continuum of badass um, speakers and advocates and bloggers because, and, and caregivers, because we, the, our experiences, we can kind of reach back and pull somebody up that mm-hmm. is even like a fraction of a hair behind us is helpful because those were things that I, I'm sure that you wish you had that I know I wish I had as a, as a family caregiver that was feeling overwhelmed and isolated. That's exactly why I wrote the book was because we, my family's been through this twice. And if I had known the first time what I knew the second time, we would have been better advocates and not that we were terrible advocates for my father who passed away in 1997, but you just learn so much. So why not give other families a leg up from the start? Yeah. Why, why hold that information into myself? That's very selfish. I'm like, here, this is all I know. I'll give it all to you. And if you can use it and it, and some of it may not work for you and some of it will work great. Take it. Take whatever works for your loved ones. You get them the best care possible. Yep. Try it on. Try it on and see what it works. I think people used to say, oh, you know, I can't do what you do in speaking and and speak. And it's like for the exact same reason you said, it's you're saying it's not about me. It's about um, getting the content to the other people and helping them um, armor them so that they can um, to go in and, and have all the tools in their toolbox for success. Be badasses. Yeah. Be badasses. I, um, Even when they don't feel like it. No, you know, just put the leather jacket like on. I didn't feel like one. <laughs> yeah. Take the, <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. yeah I did not feel like a badass, but you know, but that's what you want to go for. That's your, that's the mindset I want people to have. Believe me. I did not feel like a badass when my sister was sick, but if do you, you can have, have the mindset, a, um, that, do you have a song that makes you feel like a, feel like a badass? Okay. So this is really funny. So my sister was an athlete and my high school I went to outside of Philadelphia are, we were the Tigers. So we always, my sister and I both played field hockey and lacrosse and our theme song when, especially when we're practicing, getting ready for a big game was I have the tiger. Mm-hmm. So when my sister was, she got really sick in the summer of 2018, this was like five months before she passed away. And we thought, you know, we were going to lose her at this time. She was in the hospital for a long time. And suddenly she started to like gain weight and things started to get a little bit better and her health started to improve. And she videoed herself. This is such a top athlete thing to do. She videoed herself on the the bike. That's just for your legs. I don't know what they call that. It's not a full stationary bike, but like it's a training, a trainer. Yeah. yeah. I guess I know people put it under their desk at work to get yeah, some exercise. I have a little treadmill under mine. <laughs> okay. So it's yeah. something like that. And 
she was in the hospital and she filmed herself doing it with Eye of the Tiger. And I have to tell you, that song gets everyone in my family pumped up. So nice. it's inspirational. It was so inspirational to see her do that. And of course made us cry, but also so proud of her. That's, that's that fighter that she has. Yes. That's so good. I, um, my song is the, uh, the one from the greatest showman. This is me. I, that's the one I've been like playing lately. Like if I, I work with a lot of, um, older men and boardroom C level VP level. And so sometimes I've got to like, uh, play the song to rev myself up before I go into that room. And I'm like, look out here. I come again. So, um, you gotta, you, do you know, ever do the power pose, the wonder woman. Yeah. Yeah. Wonder woman pose. Yes. I do that. That's a good one too. And that's great for caregivers. If you have a meeting with a physician or something where you feel like you have to be confrontational. And, and I know there's lots of people that are not comfortable with that. Try the, the wonder woman power pose. And, um, I'm telling you, it does something to your psyche and it really makes you feel like, all right, I can conquer the world. Yeah. Yes. If not you, who, um, well, let's, let's, I, I can see that this is going to be a a great conversation. I want to level set with everybody though, and share, you know, your, a little bit about your caregiving story. I know you alluded about your sister. Um, so just talk to us a little bit about how you, how you got here. Yeah. So I said that I grew up outside of Philadelphia. I grew up in a really lovely family. I was really blessed, um, mom and dad. And then I had two siblings, a brother and a sister. And my sister and I were best friends. She was a very rare sister in that even when she was a teenager and I was in an elementary school, she would invite me in to go hang out with her teenage friends. It's very rare. Um, so she was just a kind soul. And so I grew up in this really lovely family, loving. Of course, we weren't perfect. We had our fights and our moments, but we were really blessed. And when in 1997, my father um, was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And about 10 months later, he passed away. So it really took our family by surprise because we thought he would get better. So did the physicians. It just, you know, took a turn for the worse. And um, he was really the light of our family. He was the the center of attention, the party guy. He was so much fun, but also really cool and calm and and loving. So just a, a great light for us. So that was How hard. How old were for you family. then when your dad passed? I was 20. 20. Okay. So I was in college. And I wasn't around because I was at University of North Carolina. And like I said, I grew up in Philadelphia, outside of Philadelphia. So I wasn't there to be a caregiver and advocate. And even if I was, I was just almost you a teenager. Were I, I, w- I wouldn't have known how to be an advocate, you know, because these days are probably different and a little bit smarter than I was. So, <laughs> um, and then, you know, my family went through the whole grieving mourning process. And we talk a lot about my dad and his goofy stories and his silly jokes and, we went through this healing process and still hard, but, you know, we were able to move on. And, um, then in 19 or 2017, my sister was diagnosed with the same cancer, different Mm. strain, but also non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Again, my sister, we were caught off by a surprise because my sister was, she'd been a top athlete in college. She was a mom of two young girls. She was only 47 years old, healthy, always a healthy eater. And, we just didn't expect it. And so what happened was she had cancer for probably about a year and she didn't know it. So she had the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which caused an autoimmune disease. And then the autoimmune disease caused a lung disease. Mm. So she really got the, the triple whammy. Unfortunately, yes. the, well, the, the lung, the cancer was actually the best kind of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma you can have, which I know it sounds like a weird thing to have, but yeah, to say, but it was the good one and it was going to be curable. She did have to go through chemo, but the lung disease, unfortunately was rare. And you don't want to have a rare lung disease because not many people know how to treat it. And it was not really treatable and it was very aggressive. Mm. So she, she was from not a smoker and never smoked a cigarette in her life. Never even tried it. Mm. Never did a drug in her life. Not wow. even pot. She never did anything. Um, she drank red wine. That was her, that was her, uh, you know, vice. Yeah. But you know, what casually. was her, what was your sister's name? Megan. 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 And how, um, how many years apart were you guys? I know you said she was in high school when you were in middle school, but yeah, we were six years apart. So she was a older sister, but also like a mom sometimes. 
cool. Yeah. Mom. Like I have a sister that's 11 years older than me. I'd call her my cool mom. Like, you know, when, when mom wouldn't, cause I'm one of six kids, when my mom wouldn't go buy the treehouse wood or, you know, have this, you know, talk to her. I, I got a book about the sex education. She just kind of handed me a book. My <laughs> sister was my go-to for like all of that stuff. And I call her mm-hmm. like my cool mom. And then we ended up kind of merging together. We have, our kids are closer in age. So, um, she got married late. I got married earlier and, um, but yeah, so six years, she was your cool mom. Yeah. And she was, like I said, she was such a gentle, loving soul that taught me so much about life. So I'm really blessed to have had that life experience, even though every day I miss her. Yeah. So, so anyhow, so she, where was I with that story? So she had the lung disease. She was, she went through chemo. I have the tiger. She fought it. She got through it and she was cancer free in February of 2018. And then, um, like I said, we had, she had some tough spouts throughout that year. And then in October, she passed away of 2018, mm. three quick. days before her 48th birthday. Mm. Well, it was quick. just rough. Yeah. Quick. I'm sorry. What? Yeah. Thank you. Were you, um, do you, did you all live close at this point? No, good question. I live in Dallas, Texas, and she lived in Charleston, South Carolina. Oh, wow. And I had a two-year-old, I think at the time. So he, um, yeah, he was about two. So I did my best to fly back and forth. And my husband was so wonderful of saying, go, just get on a plane and go be with your sister. Cause he knew how close we were and how much it meant to me to be with her. And Mm -hmm. also how it lifted her to have, um, her sister, you know, we're best friends close by. Yes. Yes. I'm choking up because I think about my sister. So And plus I just wear my emotions on my sleeve. If you um, know me about that, but I um, thank you for sharing that. And it has made you stronger and both your dad and your sister, I know would be proud of what you're doing with your experience. So what, what inspired you to then like, you know, dive into this advocacy, write this book. Um, Could you have the book with you? Um, Yeah. What's it called? Can you see it? Yeah. Badass advocate becoming the champion. You're seriously ill love one deserves. Very cool. And I love your, your logo with the, with the heart after the, um, the heartbeat. It's very, yeah, and, and, um, so I asked some of my friends, you know, about when I created this, uh, had this created the, the cover and my sister was a calligrapher. She had beautiful handwriting. And they said, this kind of reminds me of, of your uh-huh. sister and that she would, she'd be able to do that like effortlessly. So I thought that's it. That's, that's it. That's the cover. That's perfect. So, yeah. So what inspired me? So my background, like you, I have a full-time job. So I'm a pharmaceutical sales trainer and I've been in the pharmaceutical sales my whole career for 20 plus years. And I started off as a rep and now I'm a trainer and I love my job. And so I'm lucky. So I'm blessed to um, work with people I love and also do what I love every day. And over this 20 years, I built this knowledge base that I, I knew I have with selling but I didn't think about it when it came to advocating for a patient. Mm -hmm. It just kind of translated because I teach reps how to speak to physicians and how to build relationships. And so naturally I was doing these things that I didn't think about because I've been doing it for 20 years. You know, it's like Mm -hmm. 10,000 hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's part of my DNA now. So, so also I knew what questions to ask. I knew how to ask nurses questions and how to gain information. I was not an expert on her lung disease. My drugs are in the respiratory uh, world, but still not have nothing to do with what my sister had. So I didn't know anything about her disease, which is called bronchiolitis obliterans, which is a mouthful. Um, It's also known as um, popcorn lung. So if you've heard heard of that, that, I think, yes, you know why, you know why you've heard it? Because, and I don't know if this is proven, but they, they've talked about it with people smoking vapor. So if there are any people listening that smoke vapor, I don't know if that's the case or not, but they've said that they think it can cause that. You do not want this lung disease. Believe me, it's aggressive and it's nasty. So anyway, so that's, that's what she had. And I realized that with my experience, it really helped me to advocate for her better. And I couldn't keep this knowledge to myself, I wanted to share it. And it's in me to teach because I'm a trainer. I love to share yes. knowledge. I'm very passionate about sharing knowledge, whatever I have. I don't want to hoard it. I want to give it away. So, and I want other people to do the same with me. Like let's all help each other. So that's why I wrote the book. 
Cause I knew you know I, why you, I call that things. a, um, and I didn't coin this, but a mindset of abundance is what you have, Aaron. Like it's, we all can be thin. We can all have amazing kids. We can have rock star careers, um, happy marriages. It's not just like in either or either. So we can all have it all type of thing. So why keep this information to yourself? I love that. Right. Right. Um, most of our, most of the listeners of this podcast are family caregivers, um, mm-hmm. like you, you know, like, like yourself, can you give us like a brief summary of the book and get an idea of how we can, um, the eight badass strategies that you share and what are some things we can do to apply that to our, our lives? Sure. So like you mentioned, there are eight badass strategies that I really narrowed it down to that stuck out to me as things that can make a difference in your loved one's care. And that's what this book is about. I want to be clear. It's not about curing your loved one. I can't tell you how to do that. I'm not a physician, but I can tell you how to help them get the best care possible. And it starts with the number one is building a support team. So I know that you're lucky because you have uh, five siblings and I'm lucky because I have a big family and we're very close. Not everyone has that. So in the book, I give ideas for people that also don't have a big family. Maybe they're an only child or maybe their family just doesn't participate. We all know we all have friends that have that too, right? So I give you different ways that you can pull people in, neighbors, maybe people from your local church, friends. They don't have to do the heavy lifting, but you can get them to relieve some of the little things to help make life easier on you. And you can focus more on the patient. So it's kind of giving that setting up that, how do I do all this? Because this is very overwhelming. So it starts off with that. Then I talk about being persistent, but also respectful. So this is where I think people struggle, caregivers, advocates. They want to be respectful to physicians, and you should. I have a lot of respect for physicians. And I think the way that I view it is we're all a team. It's not them versus us. We're all together. We're all part of the healthcare team. Even if you don't have a degree, you're still part of that healthcare team as a caregiver. Mm -hmm. So there is a point though, where you'll have to be persistent. And it's amazing what persistence can do. It may be that you give pushback on something because it doesn't feel right in your gut. You know that patient better than anyone. And that is more valuable than you even know it because you know when something's off. And that happened with my sister. She was acting really strange. A physician wouldn't know that. They don't, they don't know her personally. Now they could, they know how to treat the disease, but they don't know when something's off. So together we can work as a team and figure out, okay, something's off. We've got to have her looked at. We've got to call 911. We've got to get to the hospital, whatever it is. And then that will help. It could help save their life. Yeah. I have an example of another, another guest. um, And I'll link to her, to her episode in the show notes. Um, Gail Alba, but she, her son, they were waiting, and I might mess up the story a little bit, but she, they were waiting for him to come out of a, a coma and he was in a dark and dreary hospital room and she knew mm-hmm. her son and she it was persistent and persisted to get him in a room with light and window. And that made, um, it made all the difference. Wow. It's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I, I think that people don't realize how important it is that you know the patient, how valuable that is. It seems like, well, that's not that big of a deal, but it is. It really can come in handy. Um, So that's number two. Number three is asking strong questions. So this comes from my pharmaceutical experience. I can teach you how to ask effective questions. So it's not that I'm giving you specific questions, examples in the book, because every scenario is different, right? Everyone's journey is different, but I can teach you techniques for how to ask good questions. For example, we talk about open-ended questions versus versus closed-ended questions. So the what, how, when versus the do, is, are. You will naturally get people to open up more and get more information if you ask those open-ended questions. And I dive a little bit deeper into that. Yeah, yeah. I I like to use sometimes like help me understand, tell me, tell me more about this. Yes, like um, those are great. Keep going. What's next? Yeah, those are good. And then the other one, and this is one of the the key ones that really helped my family was prevent forgetfulness. So I don't know about you, I have a terrible memory. And when you are a patient, or even when you are a family member of a patient and you're in shock, or you're, you just got bad news, whatever it is, someone may say something to you, a healthcare provider, and you may go blank and be so in your head that, and shocked that you don't hear anything from there on out. 
So it occurred to me one day, I, like I said, I didn't live near my sister. So I was missing out on a lot of these conversations with providers and I wasn't able to be there with her in the doctor's office. My mom was. And so afterwards I would say, so what did they say? And they would kind of remember bits and pieces, not to their fault at all. And so I said, let's start recording these conversations. Now here's the caveat. You have to ask the physician. Yes. So make sure that you ask the provider, if it's a nurse, a physician, if it's okay. We never had any issues with it. We also, our goal was not to catch them in anything. Remember you're a team. It's to make sure that you don't miss any key information. Yeah. I think if you stage it up that way, I know, again, we are from a big family. My sister would do the same thing. Um, and she would just kind of set it up to say, I'm from a big family. Everybody's going to ask me about this conversation. I'm not going to remember everything. I just want to have time to soak it in. Do you mind if I record this or right. most and of there's the time? So many benefits, mm-hmm. right? Yes. So you can go back and listen. She shared it with all of you. So, and the thing is with six people in your family, you all have different personalities. You all think different way. You all have had different experiences, even though you grew up in the same family. So you will take different bits and pieces from those recordings than your sister would have if it was just her at the doctor's office. Right. So you may catch something or have a follow-up question that someone else wouldn't have thought of. It's really a valuable tool. And everybody has one on their phone. Yep. The voice so, memo. Yep. The voice yep. memo. So it's easy. I still have all of them for my sister because I can't, I can't get rid of it. But um, also her voice is on there. So I like to go back and listen to that. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good one. Um, And then I talk about gaining and applying powerful knowledge. I think this is a gap that sometimes we feel we have. We have to be medical professionals to be an effective advocate or caregiver. Not true. Uh, Even pharmaceutical sales, you don't have to be a, have a medical degree. You just need to be an expert in your area. So how do you learn more about your loved one's disease? Doing your research. If you go to my website, badassadvocate.com, I have given tons of resources, medical dictionaries, reliable websites, because most people who are thrown into this situation don't know where to begin. And being in pharmaceuticals, I've had medical directors say with work, not with me advocating for my sister or anything, here's a website that you should go to do research for your training. Here's a reliable website that I use. So I've taken those, it's public information, and I've shared it on my website because there's so much information on the internet what do you know where to begin? And how do you know what is real and valid? Yeah, they need our help in curating that thing and fast tracking to it. We They know it's out there, but like, let's shortcut it and fast track people to right. it, um, I think is uh, a very valuable to have that out there. Um, yeah. I wish yeah, I had so that's it. That's a good one. I know. Yeah. I, I, I wish I did the first time around. I'll tell you that much. Cause it really did help. Yeah. Another thing might, to note on that one is that like, sometimes I think pe- like people with siblings or extended family will, you know, Oh, they can't help. They're not physically here. Like research is something that you can easily do from anywhere. And so sometimes the person that has the disease or the person that's close, that's a primary caregiver. Like you're taking a huge load off of them by saying, let yes. me own this. Let me put some questions together for the next time you go to the doctor. Um, I physician. love that you said that. Yes. And I talk about that in my book. Everyone can play a role. I lived far away and I still felt like I advocated when my sister passed away. I had no regrets that I wasn't there for her because I advocated for her from afar. And when I was visiting her, any opportunity I got, I advocated. And there's so many ways that you can do that. Yeah. So don't feel like if we, if you don't live close, you can't have an impact. You certainly can. Um, and then I talk about being the patient's champion, I think sometimes we focus so on the disease, talking about knowledge and research. We focus so much on the disease and, and the patient fighting the disease or the illness that we sometimes forget about the well being of the patient, meaning the mental and emotional health. Mm-hmm. And you can't forget about that. So I kind of talk about that. And Brene Brown, I'm like obsessed with her. So I kind of pull in some information from her, things I've read from her book, our books. And, um, So I kind of talk about that. And then I talk about caregivers fatigue. I had a feeling that this is probably a popular subject with you. Yeah. We're all about the little things that you can do to, to ward off the feeling. I I don't even want people to be burned out. I don't want them to even get charred, slightly charred. So um, yeah, the, the, but just little things you can do to energize yourself um, in your day is definitely about how to integrate it is what we're all about. Because it's a lot. It's a lot. It's and a lot. I feel, 
it's just it, emotionally and mentally. And, you know, I wasn't my sister's caregiver. I was her advocate, right? My mom was her caregiver every day and that's exhausting. And so when I would come visit or my brother lived down the street at the time, we would relieve my mom as much as possible. You know, but everyone does have their families, their young families, their full-time jobs. So my mom would need breaks. Um, and everybody does because it's just, yeah. it's just too much. So I give you a bunch of ideas. I'm sure ones that you've touched on too yeah, in I, that chapter. I, I wanted to ask you too, like, is there, how do you, how did you, um, just kind of also just separate the disease and just have that sister relationship with your sister or that mother daughter relationship with your mother. Like, I think it's important to not just always talk about, um, that the, the disease, but live the life while you're living it. I agree. And you know what? I think that having a fresh face is really helpful. So a lot of times I was that fresh face cause I wasn't there all the time. Mm-hmm. So I would mentally on the plane ride there, to Charleston, I would mentally prepare myself to have a smile. And I would talk to my mom and I'd say, I know it's really hard. Smile as much as you can around Megan. When you come to me and it's just you and I at home, you can cry and you can be miserable and, and you can, we can talk about this, but we've got to smile around her because if we all look depressed, imagine what she's going through. Yeah. And it's really hard. So you have to be very conscious of that. It's not easy because it was very hard for me to see my sister in so much pain and just see her losing weight. And, and I knew it wasn't good. We all knew what was happening. So it's heart wrenching. It was like my biggest nightmare, Yeah, but I couldn't let the last year of her life. Now I didn't know how long she would live, but I couldn't let that be where we're all depressed around her. No, you know? were there some moments you know, of joy that kind of stick out? You know, I think just having laughter, we, we, So one time we had a friend of my sister's like best friend who was like a part of our family. She came down and visit my sister had been in the hospital for a while, which, you know, that's very hard on the patient. They start to get a little delirious because they've been there for so long. And so my brother who has a great sense of humor and myself and, and my sister's best friend, we all went to the hospital room with my sister and we had a little party. So we snuck in some booze. Nice. And we brought like snacks. And, um, now my sister didn't drink any booze. She, first of all, she couldn't have any, but she didn't want any anyway. Cause she wasn't feeling up for it. Um, I would have snuck her some wine though. If she really wanted it. I would have yeah. given it to her. And, um, so we sat there, we told stories, we laughed. I mean, my sister, because she had a lung disease, you know, we, she just sat there quietly and listened, but she would laugh. And it was so great to see a smile on her face. Yes. And I think that's really important to make the, help the patient laugh, tell stories, reminisce, take them away on a, like a mental vacation. Where can they go? So, um, so that really sticks out my mind and that, that was a good memory. I like it. Even though it's a bad time, it's a good memory. Yeah. It's, it's, it's not an all or nothing sometimes. What, um, I know I'm keep distracting you. What others, what have you gone through the eight? We've got a couple more, I think. You know what? The last one that, um, I came up with is called use the five R's daily. So I came up with this morning routine. I didn't use it at the time. I, if you've ever read the book Miracle Morning, it's, it's a part of it. And I'll, I'll link to it. That. Okay. It's, it's a, yeah, I love that book and it's all about having a morning routine. So I've kind of taken that concept and switched it around for caregivers or patient advocates of how to organize your morning and be focused. And the goal is to decrease that feeling of being overwhelmed. So what so, are the five R's? Yeah. So reflect is number one. And that is all about self-compassion, you know, however, and everyone can make it their own, right? So if that's a meditation or whatever it is, just to reflect on how am I feeling today? Where am I mentally? Number two is review. So get your calendar, which I highly recommend for any caregiver advocate. You should have a notebook, a calendar, keeping track of everything. And I'm sure you and your sister did that will um, just help you be more sane, right? And keep everything nice and organized. So review that. What's on the schedule today? What's on the schedule for this week? Is there anything I need to prepare for? It only takes a few minutes, but it'll help you to feel like you're much more prepared for mm-hmm. the day ahead. Um, re-examine. So while you're doing that, re-examine the patient's care. Is there any physician I need to follow up with? Oh, my sister came up with a question when she listened to my recording. I need to call that doctor and ask that question. I have a meeting coming up. I need to address this issue. That, uh, that we had last week with a nurse, whatever it is, maybe it's right. positive stuff. Maybe it's, you know, that difficult conversation, but you need to reexamine and prepare for it. Um, reevaluate. So you have the support team. Is everybody doing okay? You know, if you have 
um, for you with being one of six, is everyone's mental health okay? Maybe you have someone who's really struggling. Do you need to say, look, go take the weekend away or go take a night and, and I'm going to give you a break from mom or dad or whoever is the sick patient because I know that you're struggling or maybe take them out for a coffee or that glass of wine. So just kind of reevaluate where is everybody and how do we support one another? That's good. And the last one is recharge before you start the day. And that's where meditation, prayer, maybe do some yoga, maybe you go for a run, whatever's your thing that you need to do to feel good and ready for the day. Go take it on like a badass. I like it. So what, what is, um, what is, what does your morning routine look like? So my morning routine, well, I have a toddler, so sometimes it gets totally derailed. Yeah. Okay. Um, your happy, your happy day, a perfect, my morning. happy day. My yeah. happy day is I get up. I like to, um, meditate and I actually have got my toddler to meditate with me, which is really funny. Do you yeah, use an app some, or do you do anything or just, I do. I like the guided, I use, um, the insights timer. They have like a 30 day. Yeah. Um, I use calm. And, I like, yes. I'm with you. Okay. I like the guided. Yeah. yeah. I like the guided and headspace is another one I have. I just downloaded recently. I haven't um, gotten into it, but that's a good one. And, um, or I'll just do some quiet time because I do have a toddler. So sometimes I, I, need some quiet I time. that's so precious that your that your, um, your toddler does meditation with you, but a great it. thing that you're teaching them though. Like it's not even just about what you need. It's like, you're teaching them life skills, like at such a small young age of what, uh, what that can look like. Okay. Keep going. What else is in the morning? Yeah. So meditation, um, stretching and then, um, reading. So if I can get in a few minutes of reading also, um, I work on badass advocate. So that's usually towards the end. And then I'm trying to get back into this. I was so good last summer and I got off on it in the winter, but, um, doing well, 2020 push -ups. is the year of grace. I know, 2020. Some grace. Um, I know. So doing sit-ups and push-ups. So I try and do a series of where I do um, 50 push-ups or no, I'm sorry, not 50. I don't, can't get to that many. 20 push-ups, 50 sit-ups, 20 push-ups, a hundred sit-ups, 10 push-ups, and then 50 sit-ups. So that's my, oh my if I could go back and forth and believe me, my abs are killing me. Badass and abs. So, that's your next book. Oh so yeah. <laughs> well, maybe not. <laughs> Not if you saw my abs. <laughs> yeah. Well, but it does, yeah. The kids, they, the kids leave their marks. 44. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Um, uh, that's perfect. I, my routine lately has been, um, get up. Um, I don't touch my phone. That's my thing. I have a, um, a little Bible app that I read like a daily plan it takes a couple minutes for my feet hit the floor. Um, then usually I, I, I leave my clothes in the bathroom, my workout clothes. So I put those on, I've been going down oh, to do the like Peloton it. or I go work out with a trainer for um, a couple of weeks, times a week, strength training. I don't have the toddler mm -hmm. and no kids at home and, and I'm not actively caregiving. Mm -hmm. So, um, I just have the job demand to get to the desk at a certain time. And then so what? green smoothie, green protein smoothie. That's been one of my things that's energizing me. Here you go. Um, and some, my Nespresso coffee, um, mm -hmm. uh, walk the dog to try to get them to chill out, like just a quick up and down the street. Uh, the, my husband will go with me if we, if we can, um, get that in. So that's, that's usually if I can sneak some meditation there, well, but I've, um, I need to kind of layer that back into my routine. I used to be really good about the meditation when I was working out the gym. I love to sit in the sauna and do the guided oh, 10 minute meditation yeah. there. That was like my treat after a workout. Um, it is a treat. Yeah. It is so, such a treat. You're right. So those are all great things. I do a lot of reading, but mostly my reading is my bed, my nighttime routine. So I have a nighttime routine too. Yeah. And the other one I forgot to mention, I um, go over my visions. So I have a vision for each of the roles that I am in life. Um, so like, is, a it, mom, is it on paper or is it no, it's in my phone? It's written down and it's my life vision for who I want to be as an aunt to my sister's girls. Um, as a person, as a wife, as a mom, I'm also a stepmom. So I read those and it reminds me to stay focused on who I want to be. That's so good. I have a little so, vision board in my bathroom that I did with my, I have a part of a mastermind group called um, this the four of us are vision sisters. And uh, I love it. Yeah. They have, they were kind of, you know, in the caregiving space, some of them are still in it and then kind of moved on, but they're all entrepreneurs and um, so we did a vision zoom party together and 
created our vision board. And so we just kind of cut out one, some of them are artists. So some of them did nicer, beautiful ones. Mine are just They're super looked, creative. <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, we all have our strengths. Um, very cool. Well, are you ready, Aaron, for the lightning round? Yes. This is fun. Yeah. So this is, this is my book the just for you daily self-care journal kind of, yeah. there was better. Um, and so I wanted to write a book, but this also, I wanted it to be something like intentional for caregivers where they could put some self-care into their day, but not be overwhelming. And so literally you can write like every page has a prompt. Um, I love that. I have to put that it. on my website. Yeah. Color in the different images. Um, sometimes, you know, if people want to put what they're grateful for. They can add that on here. You can use it year after year, like add to it, um, answer the questions, but they're all just self-reflecting questions about yourself and um, your life. And because I think a lot of caregivers, particularly primary caregivers, they just don't put that spotlight on them. They just feel particularly Absolutely. women, they feel guilty about doing that, but mm-hmm. w- caregiving doesn't last forever. You've got to have set something up for yourself after caregiving ends. It's not an either, or you can do things while you're caregiving, mm-hmm. um, because you need to stay energized and, and show up for the people in your life, um, and show so up for true. yourself. So here we go. First question is, um, who is a person that inspires you to want to be the best version of yourself? Mm, well, that's easy. I would say my sister because she was so kind and thoughtful. So I really try and emulate some of the things that she did in life. And she, um, I told you that she, um, she played lacrosse and she was really, she brought a, a lacrosse to the South with some other, obviously leaders, not just her, but she um, really helped to influence a lot of young women and taught them some core life skills like teamwork, persistence, not giving up working hard. So, you know, I don't coach anyone lacrosse, but I try and take my skills and my knowledge and pass it on to others. Just like she, and you can like hear her, I'm sure in the background of your life, like that's um, helping. Oh yeah. I could tell you exactly what she would say at every moment. That's how close we were. That's awesome. I, I get that. I totally get that. I know Um, you do because you're close with your sisters, you know, yes, we kind of talked about this one already. So I'm going to skip that one and find a new one. Um, where would you go if you want a dream vacation? Ooh, <laughs> that is so hard. So this is a picture that I took in Cinque Terre. Oh, that's on my list. I've been once I backpacked after college with two friends to Monte Rosa, but I got to go back there. Uh, it's amazing. Um, so I will go back there, but my answer actually, I have um, Belgium is on my list on the top. So in 2024, my husband and I plan to take our kids on a around the world trip. So this is the hardest question for me to answer because I'm that's, it's my love. I love to travel. And so does my husband. And we want to give that gift to our children. We feel like if you've been around, you realize that the world doesn't revolve around you. Um, There are many different cultures and it just opens your mind to be more open to other people and not judgmental and understand that not everyone is like you. Yeah. And that's okay. That's a great thing, actually. It gets easier to travel. I remember the moment, like with my kids are in college. um, We went one year to spring break. We went to the Grand Canyon. Mm -hmm. And um, I think my youngest was eight years old. So an eight year old and a 10 year old. And that was like the moment where I thought, looked at my husband and I was like, we can, we can go places like they can, they can hold their bathroom um, habits. They can carry their own water bottle. Like they, you know, it's just, they're like little people um, and they were great. And so that was kind of the first moment it clicked. And we have, as a family, we're more into the, the memories than the stuff. Um, Me too. And so the past few years, um, probably since they were in high school, for sure, um, we have taken them on some great trips. Uh, I find deals by the way, through travelzoo.com. I get their Wednesday Ooh. email of their top 10 or top 20. I think that deals that they have. And I always kind of look for the packages that have the hotel and the flight and the trains if needed, but yet we can kind of do our own thing. Cause we're not into a lot of guided tours. We like to yeah. do more of the culture and the food and we bring our cards That's and true. Yeah, play played it when we need to chill for a I'm minute. With you. There's but we've so been many to some wonderful good trips. places. Yeah, yeah, but Europe is our place for sure. We've done the Ireland and Italy and France and Barcelona, um, or Paris and Barcelona. 
Um, but Belgium was, is a great spot. Um, I got a good place with good food. That's, that's, that's a key. Me ingredient. too. Me too. And my father worked for Pan Am when I was a, a young girl. So we traveled a lot as a family. And so that, even though I might not have appreciated it when I was 10 and 12 years old, it did give me the bug. The bug. And I, I just love to travel and I want to pass that down. That's so good. So many good stuff. Um, Okay. If you were to lose all your possessions, what item would you miss the most? Hmm. That's a good question. Pictures. Yeah. It's hard to replace those. Yeah. So, um, pictures and I also save cards. So really it's the sentimental stuff I can do with all, without all the other things, but I, um, actually put like my sister was a big card sender and she wrote me, I've actually never shared this on a podcast or anything. My sister wrote me a card be- when she was in the hospital. Um, so I, I didn't get it until after she passed away. Oh, I wow. have to say it's the best gift that she ever gave me. And she gave me wonderful gifts all the time. So I have it in a fireproof safe because I'd never want to lose that. Yeah. So those things, those cards from years and years, I'm so thankful I saved them. Cause she wrote notes. She didn't just write love Megan and she had gorgeous handwriting to boot. So, yes, you know, yes, I, those are, those are treasures. Um, yeah. super sweet. Uh, okay. Last question. What self-care wisdom would you share with a friend who's on the road to burnout? Mm. So I think it's the little things. And you said this earlier, Elizabeth, and it really, um, I was going, yes, 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 in my brain. So when you are caregiving, and I'm thinking when my sister was in the hospital, because that was so rough and it's hard to get away from the hospital because you don't want to leave them by themselves. Do the little things. You have to kind of get creative. So like Mm -hmm. what I would do is I wait till my sister would fall asleep and I knew she was okay. And then I would take a walk to like a coffee shop and have just maybe 30 minutes by myself. But the walk was a 10 minute walk. So then that's like 40, 50, almost an hour just to kind of decompress. She's sleeping. I know she's fine. And I could eat something good, have a hot coffee or or a treat, you know, treat yourself. And that's something very little that seems insignificant, but it did wonders for my mental health. So go meditate. You could go just sit in a lounge and pray. Or like I said, whatever is your thing that you need, it's just the little things to me that realize how important they are and don't let those things slip away. You have to take the time for yourself. And I agree with what you said earlier. And I'm a part of some caregiver forums on social media. I see it all the time where people say, I feel so guilty. And it's always women, nothing against men, but I think men are more rational in that way. To be honest, women have that nurturer feeling where we we feel like we have to take care 24 seven, but you have to take care of yourself. You're, you can't do it. 24 seven. That's why you need to create a support team and have people help. Yeah. It's like, I don't, you know, what are the right words we can say to kind of, um, get that into people's heads is, um, you know, I think, you know, you can't fill from an empty cup, you know, put your oxygen, like some of the things that people Mm -hmm. kind of click for them when you say those things. Um, but it's, you know, are you, how's this working for you? You know what I mean? Like, if you feel guilty, like how, how is this working for you? Is this sustainable? Um, is this scalable, you know, what would happen, you know, if you just invested a little, little bit into your, into your day and your own self-care and then see what happens, see what happens and who you show up on and show up as, and if you feel better, and if that's, you know, working, then keep doing it. But I know your loved one too. I, sometimes this can, can, um, speak to people is like your loved one wouldn't want you to yes. not do these things. Your sister would not right. want you to have been in a corner, um, in a fetal position, just, um, you know, you can have those moments. I know somebody that, um, she gives her family like three days, like when they have like a bad moment, it's like, okay, you can have your three days to kind of just, you know, throw things against the wall, be mad, be mad at the world, whatever. But then you have to like pull up your bootstraps and, and, and come yep. back, um, and show up. So that's like all that. good stuff. I like that. And, you know, I think for those of us that are more controlling and don't want to let go of the control, cause that's a fear factor too, right? If I, if I let go of the control, something may go wrong. Then I think it's all about preparation. 
So I gave a couple of tools on my website that people can use like templates and stuff, but you can certainly come up with your own. They're just there to support you, but you can do things like I typed up a letter for people that came and helped and replaced my mom. Hmm. So we could get a fa- little mini family vacation together. Cause my sister was bedridden. She couldn't go anywhere. And so my mom and my brother and um, myself and our families just went to the beach, which was like 30 minutes away. We weren't far. I mean, and her husband was there with her and her kids, but her, um, her husband works full time. So she needed a caregiver during the day. So my aunt and uncle came down and I typed up some instruction sheets. Like it yes. just was the preparation that let them know here and they feel better. They know that, okay, I can follow I'm an adult. I can do this. Yes. You know, here's where the medication is. Here's where this is. Make sure she likes this. She prefers this. She won't eat this, but she can eat that, you know? And if you have that typed up, then you can always leave it with someone, even if they're coming for an hour to relieve you. Yeah. If anything Um, in this pandemic, I hope people have learned that lesson is that even if your intention is to be that number one person, shit happens and you can get sick and, or someone, you know, and another person you love get sick. You might want to go to someone's funeral. You might want to, um, you know, go to someone's 50th uh, wedding anniversary. You don't know, but you have to have plans in place. And so getting all of those materials together, um, it, it gives you that, um, it lets the peace of mind just to sleep, knowing that it's not all on you, that there, that you have options, um, and that you need, you need, you need to get away and, and have those recharge times. Those are absolutely they're critical, critical. For, and one for- thing we didn't talk about is yeah. just talking to someone else. You know, like if, whether it's a girlfriend or a therapist, I, I cannot advocate for that enough of the mental health of a caregiver and an advocate and the patient, you know, setting that up for them too, because they're going through anguish. And so we can't hold it all inside and think we're going to be fine. It just, it's going to, it's going to come out at some point and it may not come out the way you want it to. Right. So talk to somebody, get the emotion out. Even those who don't love to talk to find a way to speak to someone, whether it's someone, you know, personally, or you don't, you know, you've yeah, got there, to are, there are options, you know, I'm part of a, um, certified caregiving consultant group. Um, mm-hmm. I work with an app called care birds that has free, um, coaching in that, um, as well. So Love for that. the caregiver, yeah. Carebirdsapp.com. I'll link to that. So there are, there are caregiving focused, um, you know, the Facebook groups, like you mentioned, Um, but it doesn't have to be one of those caregiving support groups. It could be anything, your book club, you know, your best friend, your somebody that's just kind of uh, your hairdresser, your therapist, I call it, um, (laughs) you know, just to kind of unload on. So those are, those are great things. Erin, is there, um, I'm going to link to your website. So bad, badassadvocate.com. And then I know people can find you on social media on those areas, what, anything that you would wish that we would talk about parting words of wisdom, um, for us today, you know, one, the only other thing we didn't talk about that I would say is if you are just starting this journey and your loved one has a serious illness and whether they're in the hospital or not, make sure you tap into the palliative care team. It's yes. something that I'm really passionate about. And it's just not talked when, about. I think they're when do you do that? Where? When, like, cause I think people wait too long. They do. I would do it. We did it. I didn't know about it until, or I should say, we didn't know about it until my sister was like six months into her disease. I wish we did it at the start. Once they get that diagnosis, I, I know in the beginning, they're usually still healthy, right? Not all the time, but from my experience and from my friends who have had cancer and, and some other diseases, a lot of times in the beginning, they just got diagnosed because they just started not feel well. Right. So they're still like relatively okay. And then, you know, things might go downhill, but I would, as soon as you find out, I would contact the palliative care team at your local hospital, ask your physician for a recommendation. They, so anyone who's not familiar with palliative care, they deal with the comfort side of things. So the mental health, that's what made me think of it, the um, emotional health, and they also deal with pain. So we love this person so much. The last thing we want is for them to be in physical pain. And yes, their physician can deal with the pain, but this is what palliative care teams focus on. That is their specialty yep. is making sure this person is not in mental, emotional, and physical pain. So use them from the start. They also will support families and they are a wonderful resource. They know so many 
things about people that have a serious illness, you've, you've got to tap into them. Yeah. I think that's, I love that you brought that up because I think people wait too long. Um, I, I feel like at some point when you know your journey for your loved one is going from like, this is not a curable thing, um, that that's definitely a, a place to think, okay, we, or if they're in a lot of pain and, and emotional anguish about it. Um, but we were not aware about it really either. And we were introduced to the palliative care with my dad first. Um, and then my mom, because again, she, she needed pain medication and mm-hmm. you can't go back, you know, and then she's hard to get to a physician. She was, um, yeah. she ended up being bedridden in the last couple of years of her life, but the palliative care for her was uh, in the rural area that she was in was run through hospice. Um, yep. and so, but you don't have to, they are separate. You, it's not like you are. are on, you know, have six months kind of hospice kind of does that evaluation as, oh, this person could pass within the next six months. Palliative care doesn't have that boundary. Um, Right. So palliative care is actually not necessarily for someone that's dying. So it can be for anyone with a serious illness. And I actually just did a podcast um, with a palliative care. It's called palliative care chat. And I posted it yesterday. So because it is something I'm very passionate about, the woman who wrote my foreword is my sister's palliative care physician. Ah, will and you share your I, podcast with, with us and I'll put it in the notes so that people for sure. can listen to that one. For sure. When it and and we talked about the benefits, a different conversation than you and I are having. We really focus on palliative care. And um, so I think that's the biggest thing that people need to take away is that palliative care is not end of life care. Yeah. Now they can support someone who is dying. Or like my sister, we knew that her health wasn't well, but we didn't know she was going to die in five months. We were hoping it would be years. We didn't know. Yeah. And, but they will help someone who, who was diagnosed with a breast cancer that's curable too, and just has to go through chemo in a really rough time. Like they will support also diseases that are curable. I think this is a big place where you have to lean in as an advocate, because I don't think your physician brings it up normally. No, it's underutilized for sure. And um, I think that if everyone knew about it, and was familiar. That's why I kind of want to shout it from the rooftops that go reach out to out of care teams because we, none of us know about it or very little of us, and they are such an asset to you. So use it, use the asset that you have. Yep. Agree. Agree. Great tip. Aaron, this has been lovely. This conversation, you are a badass advocate. I'm going to feel like a badass for the rest of the day in my leather jacket. And, um, I've appreciated this conversation with you. So it was so much fun. Thank you for having me. I love talking. I could talk to you all day. (laughs) I know. Yeah. (laughs) Thanks for joining us today on the Happy Healthy Caregiver podcast on the Whole Care Network. As always, show notes that accompany today's episode can be found on my website, happyhealthycaregiver.com. Just look under the podcast menu for today's episode image, and that will take you to the page with the links and information we spoke about today. You'll also find other resources on the website, along with links to purchase the Just For You daily self-care journal. When you purchase from my website, you'll get a signed copy and for a limited time, free shipping. If you've enjoyed what you heard today, consider subscribing to the show on your podcast platform. It really helps other family caregivers find the podcast and you'll automatically receive our bi-weekly shows in your podcast listening queue. Maybe while you're subscribing, consider leaving a five-star rating and review or just simply talk it up on your social channels. Let's stay connected. I'm on Instagram and Facebook as Happy Healthy Caregiver. And until we meet again, please take care of you. This is WCN, the Whole Care Network. You talk, we listen.